Next is an overview of head injury, followed by your nursing role in caring for a child who has a head injury. Head injuries involve the scalp, skull, meninges, or brain, and result from blunt trauma, shearing forces, or penetrating injuries. The major causes of brain damage or injury in childhood are falls, bicycle injuries, motor vehicle accidents, sport injuries, and gunshot wounds. You might hear the terms coup, contra coup, shearing, and maximum shearing in association with head injury. The physical forces of acceleration and deceleration cause deformation of the skull and mass movement of the brain. This deformation can cause bruising directly at point of impact, that would be coup, or indirectly at a distance as the brain strikes the skull away from the point of impact, that's contra coup. Shearing forces are caused by unequal movement or differing rates of acceleration at various points in the brain. Maximum shearing forces are on the cerebral surface but the most serious effects are often in the brainstem. The most common head injury is a concussion, a transient or prolonged reversible alteration of consciousness, which may be followed by amnesia, vertigo, nausea, and weak pulse. Breathing can be unusually rapid or slow. When consciousness returns, the child is likely to have a severe headache and possibly blurred vision. Post-traumatic amnesia is characteristic of a concussion and consists of two parts, Retrograde amnesia, the period of time before impact, and anterior grade amnesia, memory loss after injury. Memory of both of these periods generally returns over time, although there may be some permanent amnesia. It's important to remember that loss of consciousness is not necessarily a hallmark of concussion, especially in children. Confusion and amnesia are more accurately defined concussion. Contusions are petechial hemorrhages along superficial areas of the brain at the point of impact, again coup, or at a distance, contra coup. The areas of the brain most susceptible to contusions or lacerations are the frontal, occipital, and temporal lobes. Signs of contusion vary from a mild, brief extremity weakness to unconsciousness and paralysis, and can be difficult to distinguish from a concussion. Although cerebral lacerations are usually associated with penetrating or depressed skull fractures, they may occur without fracture in small children. We'll discuss that in a few minutes when we review shaken baby syndrome. Bleeding in and around a tear in brain tissue causes longer and more severe unconsciousness and paralysis, resulting in permanent scarring and some degree of residual disability. Head injuries also include fractures. They can be linear, usually from a low velocity impact. This type accounts for the majority of childhood fractures, but they are uncommon before the age of two to three years. They are often asymptomatic and heal in three to four months without special treatment, unless there is involvement of a blood vessel, a cranial nerve, a paranasal sinus, or the brainstem. Your client might also have a depressed fracture, with the bone broken locally into irregular fragments that are pushed inward, causing pressure on the brain. This requires surgery to elevate the fragments. It is also uncommon before the age of two to three years, as the softer infant skull indents instead of breaking creating a ping-pong ball-like depression. Or it might be a compound fracture where tissue laceration extends to the site of the skull fracture. This requires surgical debridement, reduction of the fracture, and antibiotic therapy. A basilar fracture involves the basilar area of the frontal, sphenoid, ethnoid, temporal, or occipital bones. Signs and symptoms include bleeding or leaking of CSF into the nose, nasopharynx or middle ear, a positive battle sign, that's discoloration behind the ear, and raccoon eyes, or evidence of hemorrhage around the eyes. And finally, there are diastatic fractures or traumatic separations of cranial sutures. The lambdoid suture is most often affected. This is rarely seen after age four and usually requires no treatment. Cerebral complications due to skull fracture include hemorrhage, infection, edema, and herniation through the tentorium, which is the dura mater supporting the occipital lobes and covering the cerebellum. With hemorrhage, epidural or extradural blood, usually arterial, rapidly accumulates between the dura and the skull, creating a hematoma. Signs and symptoms vary with the location and severity of the injury. They include loss of consciousness, dilatation and fixation of the pupil on the affected side, weakness or paralysis, and increased deep tendon reflexes on the opposite side of the injury, decerebrate posture, and abnormal respirations. Children can have nonspecific symptoms like headache, vomiting, and irritability for 48 hours or so after the injury. 
Clinically significant epidural hematomas are rare in children younger than four years due to the increased resilience of the skull, escape of blood through the fontanelles, and a lower systolic blood pressure. There can be subdural bleeding, usually venous, between the dura and the cerebrum. This is more common than epidural hematomas and is seen most often in infancy due to birth trauma, falls, assaults, or violent shaking. It can be acute, associated with contusions or lacerations, and developing within minutes or hours of the injury. Signs and symptoms include increased head circumference, bulging fontanelles, retinal hemorrhage, hemiparesis, quadriplegia, altered level of consciousness, and unsteady gait. It can also be chronic, common in children with open fontanelles and sutures. Signs and symptoms vary with the brain damage sustained and the age of the child. They include seizures, vomiting, drowsiness, increased head circumference, irritability, personality changes, headache, developmental delay, and failure to thrive. There can also be subarachnoid and intercerebral hemorrhage. Signs and symptoms include seizures, nuchal rigidity, and altered level of consciousness, depending on the amount and location of bleeding. Another complication is cerebral edema, which always develops to some degree after head trauma and usually peaks 48 to 72 hours after the injury. This edema results in an increase in brain tissue volume, carrying the potential for increased intracranial pressure, or ICP. The extent and severity of the injury are factors that determine the degree of cerebral edema. Anatomically, the skull is an empty cavity with three rigid sides containing blood, brain, and cerebral spinal fluid. These components exert pressure on the skull. This intracranial pressure is normally 0 to 15 millimeters of mercury and is maintained by rapid alterations among the components throughout the day. Increased ICP is a life-threatening event that results from an increase in pressure in any or all of the three components within the skull. Let's take a close look at the assessment of a child with a head injury. The initial assessment consists of the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, spinal cord injury, presence of shock, and a neurological exam. During the neurological exam, you'll assess the level of consciousness. Did the child lose consciousness at time of injury? pupillary symmetry and reaction to light, any retinal hemorrhages, seizures, or memory loss. Next, you'll examine the scalp for lacerations, palpate for depressed skull fracture, widely spaced sutures, and the size and tension of fontanelles. Inspect for bleeding or drainage from the nose, mouth, or auditory canals, and test any drainage present for glucose. Ongoing assessment includes assessing level of consciousness and observing for signs of increased ICP. Early, there would be irritability, restlessness, anorexia, and headache. Intermediate signs are projectile vomiting, sluggish, unequal pupillary responses, papilledema, blurred or double vision, bradycardia, hypertension, and seizures. And late, alterations in level of consciousness, decreased reflexes, decreased respirations, hyperthermia, herniation of the optic disc, and a cerebrate posture. You'd also assess for signs of epidural and subdural hemorrhage. Diagnostic tests such as a CT scan, MRI, or skull radiography are likely to be ordered. Now, what about your nursing care? Basically, it's bed rest and continued observation with a clear liquid diet if the child is conscious and IV therapy if unconscious or unable to tolerate oral fluids. You'd monitor neurological status, level of consciousness, pupil response, symmetry of movement, vital signs, and signs of increased ICP. You'll decrease environmental stimuli, elevate the head of the bed 30 degrees, maintain NPO, followed by progressive diet as ordered and tolerated. You'll monitor intake and output accurately and often, and weigh the child daily. In addition, you'll take seizure precautions, collaborate with the parents in evaluating the child's behavior, and encourage family support and involvement in the child's care. Surgery might be done to decrease pressure and remove bone fragments, and continuous ICP monitoring is another possibility. Drug therapy might involve antiepileptics to prevent seizing, corticosteroids to reduce swelling, osmotic diuretics to reduce brain volume and decrease intracranial pressure sedatives and analgesics for pain management and to decrease metabolic demand, and antibiotics to prevent infection. What about home management? If the child has a mild to moderate concussion with no loss of consciousness, 
You'll teach parents to check the child's level of consciousness every two hours, maintain contact with a health care provider, and return to the health care provider within one to two days for a recheck. Remember, signs of epidural hematoma generally appear 24 or more hours after the injury, so you'd provide written instructions for parents as well as appropriate contact numbers in case of emergency. Advise parents to use automobile seat belts and safety seats properly and helmets when appropriate, such as when the child is bicycling, playing sports and riding scooters and skateboards. Another preventable type of head injury is called shaken baby syndrome. Healthcare providers suspect shaken baby syndrome when an infant less than one year old has subdural and or retinal hemorrhages in the absence of external signs of trauma. Prevention is the cornerstone of your teaching. Make sure parents understand that they must never shake a child as a method of burping or waking an infant. Toss an infant in the air or shake the infant when feeling upset or angry.